California was the first state to legalize medical marijuana, when labs started reporting that they were finding high levels of pesticide residues, the L.A. city government covertly acquired and then tested three samples from dispensaries and found that two of the three samples did have exceedingly high pesticide levels, up to a thousand times the legal limit. Uh, yeah, but how much ends up inside the consumer? Only about 10% or so of pesticides in tobacco makes it through a filtered cigarette, which was found to be comparable to using cannabis in a water pipe with filters attached. But use a regular bong, and about half the pesticides end up in your lungs, and a glass pipe is even worse. Because most users don't attach a carbon filter to their bong with 7.5 grams of activated charcoal, in general, the portion of pesticide recovery from cannabis would be alarmingly high and is a serious concern. Although we don't know precisely how damaging these chemicals are, the fact that they're present in smoke at such high levels should be concerning. Considering these results, high pesticide exposure through cannabis smoking is a significant possibility, which may lead to further health complications in cannabis consumers, especially if we're talking about medical marijuana, sick, vulnerable people, potentially making things worse. The potential of pesticide and chemical residue exposure to cannabis users is substantial and may pose a significant toxicological threat in the absence of adequate regulatory frameworks. OK, so what are states doing about it? Colorado recently suffered some high-profile recalls of marijuana batches contaminated with harmful pesticides that made it into some of the edibles. Evidently, growers sometimes find themselves overwhelmed by pest issues and resort to nuclear tactics, trying anything to protect their crop. This has created a public health threat, with intensified toxicity and concentrated products of particular concern. Pesticide levels were found to be approximately 10 times higher in concentrated cannabis products, like the oils and waxes sometimes used in edibles or dabbed as concentrates. A study of pesticide use on cannabis crops in Oregon uh, found a similar problem. Uh, a survey of samples off store shelves in Washington state found five out of six contaminated, including with potentially neurotoxic and carcinogenic agents. Many samples harbored multiple contaminants, uh, attaining levels basically off the charts including 24 distinct pesticide agents, insecticides, fungicides, none of which are approved for use in cannabis. But it's not their fault. The EPA hasn't approved any because it's still a federally illegal crop. In fact, testing labs in California have become hesitant to publicize their service or, or list agents for which they could test, as they suspect that such information might be used as like an instruction manual by unscrupulous growers to seek out even more toxic agents. OK, so just regulate it. They've tried, but guess what was the biggest barrier they came up against? Surprise, surprise, the cannabis industry, the multi-billion dollar cannabis industry. Like the tobacco industry before it, the cannabis industry is attempting to weaken pesticide regulations. Reportedly, the Colorado Department of Agriculture initially hoped to limit permissible pesticides to the most non-toxic, but this proposal was quashed by industry pushback, just like the tobacco industry was able to do. Big Tobacco has provided a detailed roadmap for king cannabis, deny addiction potential, downplay any adverse health effects, create as large a market as quickly as possible, and protect that market through lobbying and campaign contributions. Bolstered by enormous profits, the tobacco industry was able to get itself exempted from every major piece of consumer protection legislation. So that should be a cautionary tale for us now given that public health advocates have definitively fewer billions to work with. Big Tobacco may not just be providing the roadmap, but waiting in the wings to own the road. 
as a result of lawsuits against the tobacco industry, more than 80 million pages of internal company documents became available, and what they reveal is that since at least 1970, despite fervent denials, major multinational tobacco companies like Philip Morris have been scheming, willing and prepared to enter the legalized marijuana market to become big blunt. Because the tobacco industry's demonstrated ability and willingness to modify its products to increase addictiveness, obfuscate information, deceive the public, and target vulnerable groups to increase demand, the industry has the power to dramatically change the game.